man, we've been missing you guys. I mean, it, I know it feels like we were just here like three weeks ago, but still, we've been missing you. Is everybody doing okay? Good. Um, just so we can just jump right in and be on the same page, if you guys feel like turning to Isaiah 43, we're going to start right there. And I really, usually I would open in prayer with it, but I want to read the scripture verse first, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll jump right in, if that works for you. So I'll give you like 13 seconds to get there. You have to be really quick with me. Does that work for everybody? You're down to nine seconds. I tried to swallow as quietly as possible. Okay, let's, let's pretend that you're all there. And uh, are we good? Are we ready for the scripture? Okay, read now Isaiah chapter 43, starting in verse 18. And this is the Lord speaking. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. That's good. That's good stuff. Okay, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the, for the new things that you're, that you're building around us. We thank you whether we, we perceive them or not. Father, we appreciate that you're willing to work new things for us. And God, I just ask that you would be with us and that your word would be spoken here, that it would be proclaimed by me and only through your word. God, I don't want anything that I have to say to be out of my mouth. Father God, I want it to come from you. And so we just lift you up in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. That's good stuff, right? Because he's doing new things. And we all just automatically assume that they're, that they're good things because he said they're new. Why do we assume that they're good things? See, because when I read that scripture in a church, then everybody gets really excited. But if a police officer walks up and says, hey, we're going to try something new, maybe not so much, right? Why do we assume that when God says he's doing something new, that it's going to be something that we really like? Well, we know, we know God, do, right? We've met him before a couple times, once or twice, heard from him, have, have understood that, that all things that he does work out for our good, right? Romans 8, 28. We just got done singing that song this morning. Yes? So we know that what he has for us will work out for good. You'll never read in Scripture where it says that, I, that, that God works everything to feel good at that exact moment. Right? We, we, you, you will never read in Scripture where, where it says that, that everything will have very short-term gratification. Be, because, in, and here's the fun part with this, is this Scripture that we just read, the Isaiah chapter 43, is this is God talking to the people of Israel, and he just spent the past 17 verses talking to them about what he has done for them. And he's given them just kind of a brief history of, oh, do you guys remember the time I got you out of Egypt? Do you remember the time I split the Red Sea for you? Do you remember all these great things I did for you? And then he starts it off with, forget those things. I'm doing something else. And see, it's, it's major for, for the people of Israel because they got used to God just kind of handing them things. They didn't really have to work for, for getting out of Egypt. He just split the Red Sea, and it was, wasn't that big of a deal. But he, he, he says he's doing something new. And we know because of the character of God that it's something that will eventually be good. But we don't know exactly how that ends up playing out. And the thing is, 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 this, is this is a people he's speaking to who are currently in Babylonian captivity. Does that feel good? Does that feel like a fun situation you want to be in? I don't want to be in captivity. But so he says, okay, I'm going to do something new, and they just automatically assume, okay, he's going to break us out. We're, we're good. We're about to go home. Does anybody know how that played out? No. Regime change. They, they went from Babylonian captivity to Persian captivity. Yay! Thank you, Lord, for the new things you're doing in my life. Right? Okay. So... It doesn't stop there because th th throughout the history of that, then we, then we learn that eventually, well, okay, well, you're still going to be Persian citizens, but you get to go back to Jerusalem. And so you're no longer under Persian captivity, but it's like occupation. And then, okay, well, new regime change, and eventually the Romans move in. Yay! Thank you, Lord, for this Roman occupation. But, but God is working all of these terrible situations out for the good. 
because as each empire moves in, then the world kind of kind of grows around them a little bit bigger and the infrastructure grows so that they have roads where they can get from town to town, where they can, where they can have trade routes. And it's, it's this entire concept of, of the different empires that help to where when Jesus finally comes and, and, he, and he dies for our sins and he does all of those good things that we get to spread the gospel that much faster. And it all starts with Babylonian captivity. Yay! Thank you. Appreciate these new things you're doing in our lives, Lord. So, we don't always enjoy it. He will do new things. Because he's God, he's so infinite, he would get so bored if he had to do the same thing for you all day, every day. He's so big, he's so infinite, that we don't know what's at the bottom of his pockets. We'll never get there. But he's got something new for us every day. But we hit this point where we just want the same old, same old. I want to come to church on Sunday, and I want somebody to preach to me, and then uh, we'll go home and see what happens. What if he wants to speak to you on a Tuesday? Well, that would be weird. On a Tuesday, Lord? He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What if he spoke to you on a Saturday night? Ooh. <laughs> but he can do that. He is so big. He's so infinite. Why do we want to put him in a box? Hold on. I preached ahead of my notes. Now I'm going to catch up. But so knowing how big he is and, and how, how much more he has for us, and we, we have in our head that we know better than what, the, what he should be doing, that, okay, well, this God, if you could do this for me in this exact specific way, and if it could look come in the form of a raise or a bonus, that would be really good. And we, and we have these things lined out, and we think, okay, I can plan how God is going to do these new things, because we know he's going to do the new things. Okay, but look at Isaiah 55, 9, and it should be up on the screen. Okay, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Let's just say he's smarter than we are. Let's, let's just say he's, he's more powerful than we are. The, the best way I know to explain this verse to where you really get it is, have you ever seen a dog scratch their head? And they got to, like, flip their leg up, like, pretzel style, and then they start kicking up here. And you watch them, and they're like, why do you have to scratch your head so weird? Because that's the best way that they could possibly figure out. And when you're watching it, it's frustrating because it's like, quit kicking yourself in the head. I'll just scratch it for you. Okay? But, but God is looking down on us going, quit kicking yourself in the head. I can do this. His ways are so much better than our ways. But we think we've got it all figured out that this is the way we want to do it. Quit kicking yourself in the head and let God do things the way he wants. Okay? The entire thing is... Preaching today about expectations, by the way. I don't know if you guys could pick up on any of this, but see, we expect things to look a certain way. We expect church to go a certain way. We expect four or five songs, and then somebody's going to preach, and then we may pray for a little bit, and then we're going to go out, and we're going to eat at Roses or Chili's. I haven't decided yet. Okay? But we, we know how we think we expect things to play out. But God is... God, he's... he's I'm trying to, trying to think of a fun, not demeaning way of explaining it. He's, he's, he's like a wild goose. Yes, that wasn't demeaning at all. It's the way he, the way he works, you never know whether he's going to zig or he's going to zag. And so if you're trying to chase him or you're trying to chase God, you don't know which direction he's going to take you in that pursuit. And that's kind of the problem that the people of Israel ran into along these lines, because we, you know, we've, if you can tell, I've covered like a couple hundred years of history. We're already into Roman occupation now, which is the perfect time for Jesus to come and for him to do the work that was set before him. But the problem is, is that the people of Israel were expecting it to look a certain way. They had these expectations of, okay, well, we know that, that for us to rule under a, ki a, a kingdom, then it has to be a very powerful kingdom. So we know that, that when the Messiah comes, he's going to come in and he's going to be so powerful. And he's going to have the most powerful army. He's going to kick the Romans out and everything's just going to be peachy. Everything is just going to be so great. 
And that's not how Jesus came at all. See, because his, his first public speaking event was the Sermon on the Mount, and the first thing he says is, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. And they're like, no, we want a revolution. He says, no, blessed are the peacemakers. And he, and he takes everything that they were expecting, everything that they were anticipating from the Messiah, and he says, no, that's not how this is going to work out at all. But they thought they knew better. Everything about Jesus threw the people of Israel for a loop. They didn't have a clue what he was doing. And he, we know that he worked everything out for the good. We know that he, he paved the way for our eternal salvation. They didn't know that's what that was going to look like. But if you, I mean, Jesus came in such a way that even his conception, he went from being the eternal king of the universe sitting on the throne in heaven, that he was, he was conceived before marriage. And he grew up in a small town, so people knew that about him. Could you go from being the king of heaven to, to having dirty words whispered behind your back about who, who you are? Can you believe that? His mom got pregnant before they were even married. Now, we know, we know better. We know that there was, a, I mean, it was a miraculous conception, but just the entire concept of who Jesus is, he didn't look anything like what, what we thought he should. If you, even his teachings on the religion, because he was, he was a Jew, he grew up under the Jewish traditions, but he didn't, he didn't always speak highly about the Jewish traditions, did he? And you had, you had the, the religious people of the day, you had the Pharisees, and they would always talk about how great it was to look this holy and to smell this holy and, and to, to be exactly this perfect. And Jesus had nice things to say about them, like how they were snakes and how they were whitewashed bones and how they were, they were graves that were, were dead on the inside. And it didn't really rub people the right way. Because he said, you're, you're trying to make it look like how you think it should look, but that's not how we're doing things. I would much rather go along with the way God's doing things than, than try to make it look the way I think it should. Correct? So, I mean, this is, this is Jesus who preaches, blessed are the peacemakers. And then he says, you know what, let's go flip a couple tables in the temple. And, and I'm not saying that he's, he's at all hypocritical. I'm saying that he was making peace look a little different than how they thought it should look. If you, if you will, go ahead and turn with John to John chapter 19. And see, we're talking about Jesus and, and how he never looked the way that we thought he should look. And we're, we're talking about how the salvation he brought us never, never came off the way that we thought it should the way that we expected it to play out. John chapter 19. This is Jesus mid-crucif... Well, close to the end of the crucifixion. After he's been beaten, had his beard ripped out, had people spit in his face, nails driven through his hands and his feet. And so there he is. He's, laying, he's hanging on the cross. And so starting in chapter... 19 verse 28, by the way. Later, knowing that everything had been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, if you want to rewind John in a couple chapters, he's, he runs into this lady at a well, and, and he asked her for a drink, and then he says, by the way, if you would ask me for a drink, I would give you eternal water. I would give you living water so that you would never thirst again. And here's the Savior of the universe who, who is the living water hanging on a cross saying, man, I'm thirsty. And I've, I've always humanized that to, to such an extent because, well, you have to understand, he just drug a, I don't know, 90, 100-pound cross, 600 yards uphill. I would be thirsty. Granted, he, he went through a lot more excruciating a situation than, than anything, but I always tried to humanize it. Well, I mean, absolutely, the dude's thirsty. But you have to think about the, the tragedy that is that statement, that he was, he is the living water 
hanging on a cross saying, I am so thirsty. He's, he's the one who was there at the creation of the universe who decided, okay, if we put a couple hydrogen molecules with an oxygen molecule and we mix that up a little bit, we'll make water. He figured that out. And here he is saying, I'm thirsty. He's, everything about Jesus was a curveball. Do you, you, do you get that? That he never, he never looked the way that we thought he would. But if he had, if he'd looked the exact same way that everybody just perceived that Jesus should look, I don't think it would have played out the same. I don't, I don't know that it would have gone the way that God had it envisioned. But see, he had, to, he had to say this. He had to say he was thirsty, and they had to give him the bitter drink because that was prophecy number 300. And before that, he was sitting at 299 going, man, I just got this one last thing to do, and then, and then it's good. But the, the amazing thing with that is that he, upon receiving that drink, everything was finished. Everything was done. He was, he was no longer limited to, to drinking that cup of suffering, which, by the way, I kind of think was, was a little bit of a... I think there's a certain amount of irony there that the night before he was praying, Lord, if, it, if it's be your will, let this cup pass for me. And then he says, okay, I'm thirsty. He, he, he more or less accepted the thing that God was handing him. But so looking at that and knowing that Jesus never looked the way that, that people expected him to look and the work that he did dying on the cross and saving us from our sins never looked the way that we thought it should, never looked the way that the people of Israel perceived that it, that it should play out. Why do we in, in the 21st century church think that, that everything is going to look the way that we think it should? I just... Oh, that's, that's, that's a rhetorical question. I'm just going to let that sit there for a second. But there's a lot of different things that we think, we think we should know how it should work. We think we should know how it should look. And we don't have a clue what God has envisioned for that. If you turn to Luke chapter 18, if you would. See, because we've talked about Jesus not looking the way that we, we thought it should. But now let's look at the people of God not looking the way that we think they should. Luke chapter 18, verse 9, and it reads a little bit like this. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people robbers or evildoers or adulterers or even like this tax collector here i fast twice a week and i give a tenth of all i get and i am really fantastic i threw that last one in but you get the gist of it that's that's exactly who this guy thinks he is he thinks i look so good don't i god don't i look so fantastic i look like i've got everything together and then it says that there's another man he said, who was a tax collector, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even approach the altar, and he wouldn't even look up to heaven. All he did was just beat his breast and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus goes on to say that, that between the two men, that one's the one that went away justified, not the one who looked so good, who, who put such a good front on in the church, who talked about how fantastic he was and all the things he did for God. You're welcome, Lord. I did so good for you. It's this guy that goes away justified. So why do we think we have to come in in our Sunday best and we have to look so nice and pretty when we know that that doesn't have anything to do with our salvation? It's this guy who goes away justified. It's the one who, who has no confidence on his own whatsoever. He is saved entirely by grace, as opposed to the person who says, I'm doing so good for you. See, I can preach this because this is kind of where I've, I've, I've gone through a really big-headed phase in my life, and I feel like I'm attempting to come out the other side of it. But I used to think I was just so great. I mean, because I was raised in church. I was raised in this church, actually. But... I mean, and, and I was just so fantastic, and I, and I, I mean, I was, I was a lot better than all the other kids, you know, and I, and I, I mean, I looked better, and I smelled better, and I was, just, I was just a lot better than everybody else. That's a lie. I'm just playing with you. Okay? But that's not at all what saves you. That's not at all what secures your relationship with Christ. That's not at all what secures your relationship with the Lord. 
and the bigger your head gets about it, the further away you get from God. And I can, and I can, I can say this because it's, I mean, it's, it's a lesson I've been learning over years, years, long years. But I'm, we're getting there. I'm finally learning that I don't have to look the way that I, that I think I should look. I don't have to always have my Sunday best on for God to speak to me. I don't always have to have my life together. I don't always have to, to smell perfect. By the way, I don't. Terrible right now. But um, I'm nervous. I'm sorry, guys. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be perfect by any standard. That's the beautiful thing about what, what God did for us is because we as a people, look at your neighbor just for a second. Any, anybody sitting close to you, perfect? If you're married, you better say yes. Okay? But you know that we're all flawed. You, you know that we all mess up. You know that, that everybody's got an ugly tool. But the beautiful thing is, is that God would rather hear an ugly prayer than, than a proud one. He would rather hear you sob and, and blow snot bubbles and talk about how much you need him rather than how great you are and how much you don't really need him. And so, so as a church, as a, as a people group, not just this church, but, but as the people of God, why isn't it okay to, to come to church and let your ugly show? Them's my bacon socks. I just, I just, I couldn't come here and put on my Sunday best and then talk about how I don't always look my best. By the way, I have my bacon socks on. Okay? We, we can't look the way that we think we should. And, I, and I'm, I'm a firm believer that past generations who, who always believed that you couldn't come to church unless you had your Sunday best on did such a harm to, to the people did such a harm to, to who the church was, was actually building to be because we got this idea that, that our perception was more important than the relationship we had with God. I would rather see ugly people come in in ratty clothes with no makeup who smell terrible but know exactly where they stand in their relationship with God. So if it takes you 30 minutes less time doing your hair because you don't care about it on Sunday morning, then you get to spend that 30 minutes doing something like getting closer to God. We, we can do something along those lines, but we have this idea that we have to look a certain way because we have these expectations of who the, the holy people of, the God, of God look like. I don't look like that. Mike's rubbing his face. You look like that. You're a handsome fella. Okay, so attempting to move on. I just told the guy he was handsome. We better move on quickly. I'm going to preach over here now, Mike. I'm sorry. Mark chapter 10, verse 43. Actually, while you're getting there, I got a minor side note. I forgot to talk about this, and I feel like it's an important thing. You'll, you'll notice that the, the character of the previous story who went away forgiven was a tax collector. In those days, under the Roman occupation, since we already brought that up, the people who collected the taxes were actually Israelites who were almost considered traitors to their people because they would collect the taxes for the Romans from their fellow Israelites. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's not really a snitches get stitches situation, but it's kind of like a loan shark thing. I don't know where would, you, you're kind of a traitor and nobody really likes you because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and nobody likes that you're doing that. But these are the people that Jesus chose to hang out with. He was hanging out with the tax collectors. He was hanging out with the prostitutes. What would we do if a prostitute came into church? Not touching that one. Not going there. Okay? But we have to be a lot more open to who we love because God loves them. What would you do if you had to sit next to the IRS guy in service? Uh, may, not, may not walk out with your salvation that time. Did we make it to Mark chapter 10? And I'm actually approaching closing, so if you, the worship team wants to come back up, you can. That's quick, by the way. You guys are totally getting to lunch before noon. Okay. But Mark chapter 10, verse 43. 
and this is, this is actually one of the funnier stories between the disciples because they're all arguing about who's, who's so much better than who else. And so, well, you know what? I'm pretty sure Jesus loves me more than everybody. And that was John the Beloved saying that because he gave himself the nickname John, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And his brother, the sons of thunder, and, and they were arguing and they had their mom come ask if they could be the, the number one and two in heaven. And, and Jesus, in response to all that, says, says you know, you, you guys always hear about people who, who lord it over them that I'm so much better than you. And Jesus says, starting at verse 43, not so with you. Instead, whoever, wants to, wants, whoever among you wants to be great must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I don't, I don't know who cleans the church anymore. I know it used to, used to be a couple different people, but, but that person, not the one standing up on the stage, is, is, is the greatest in the church. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. You super spiritual people saying that makes sense. It doesn't make sense at all. Because I'm up here, and I'm special, and I'm important, and I'm great. I'm the greatest in the church. Negative. Not true at all. Okay? Only the servants, only, only the ones who are willing to, to serve other people, who are willing to lift other people up, who are willing to do the dirty work, those are the greatest in the kingdom. The church doesn't look like how it's supposed to look. The church, we, we don't get to set these standards of our expectations of this is what the church looks like. It has to be this holy, must be this holy to enter. No, God's looking for the janitors. He's, he's looking for the Mother Teresas and the, and the, that's the only example I had. I don't know. He's, it's hard to find somebody that you can just, just off the top of your head say, yes, that person will serve anybody. But you take a lesson from the people at Chick-fil-A. Because when you go there and they hand you your food, you say thank you. What do they say? My pleasure. Okay? When, when somebody asks me to do something, when they ask me to do my job, and it's, and it's something I don't really feel like doing, but I guess I'll do it anyway. And they say, okay, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. No, it's my pleasure to serve you because I, this is securing a higher, a higher status for me in the kingdom of God. This is... This is how you get promotions is you serve more people than everybody else serves people. See, Jesus and, and his kingdom and, and everything turned our status system upside down. He, he threw the whole system for a loop by being, by being a king who was born out of wedlock, by being, by being the savior of the world who was just a thirsty human. He... He turned everything around. He turned everything on its head. We have to be that peculiar people. We, we can't be the ones who think, okay, well, if, if I can get on the TV with a suit, then I've made it. Then I know that I'm a really important person. Right? Nothing in life will go exactly the way you plan it. Nothing. Because God is always going to do a new thing. Just, just when you, you start setting into a good routine, then, then you end up having a baby or something along those lines. Just when I think I'm getting real good with my daughter, she'll start doing something fun and new. Like, she's spitting. She learned how to spit. <laughs> and not just, I mean, drool is acceptable, but it's like, pff, pff. she does it on purpose, and she loves it. My, she, she does this fun new thing, and, it, and we're talking about new things, so I can, I can just stand up here and brag about how cool my daughter is. We go into the sanctuary at church, and only when it is quiet does she just start growling like some form of monster. And it is beautiful, and it's fantastic, and it's just like, ah. And I love that about her. And I love that, that she doesn't have to look any particular way. Babies get so much leeway in how their appearance is supposed to happen because, I mean, like if a kid has drool running down their chin, not acceptable at all for an adult, by the way. But, but a kid, okay, that's acceptable, that's fine. But we're the children of God. And he's looking down on us and he said, it doesn't matter how, how messed up you think you are. You guys just play anything, that's fine. Um, he, just, he just wants you. 
covered in your drool and, and whatever other issues you've got. He just wants you and he just wants to spend time with you because he's got good things planned out for you. It may be a curveball. It may be something that you don't expect, but he's, he's absolutely got something good in store for you. You may have to get through 14 different flavors of not good before it feels good, but he's, he's got the best things worked out for you. He's planning something new in your life. plans up with God's plans, whether it feels good or not, we know it's all going to work out for the good. We know that. Um, guys, I, I, it really is. It's super early. So if we just, if we just pray over this concept for, for just a couple minutes, you'll have to bear with me because you're still getting out of church way before Pastor Todd would let you out, way before Pastor Todd would let you out. But let's just, let's just pray over this concept for a second. Father God, I just thank you that you're always doing something new in me. I thank you that you will never allow me to stagnate, that you'll never allow life to get stale. Father God, you're always doing a new thing. God, and I, th I thank you, Lord, when it doesn't feel good. I thank you when it, when it hurts. God, I thank you for all the situations, whether it's a good one or a bad one, in my opinion, Father, because I know that you're working it all out for your good. So God, over your people, I just proclaim, God, a new season. God, I, I proclaim, Father, that the next great awakening won't happen in a Sunday service. God, I, I believe that it's gonna happen out on the, on the streets on a Tuesday. I believe that the next great revival won't happen at the altars. Father God, I believe it'll happen out in the Walmart parking lot. God, I pray that you would continue to show us what your will is. Father, that we would always be in sync with you as your people, as your church. God, but that we would be with you every step of the way. God, I don't want you to have to drag me to my destiny. Father, I want to meet you there. So God, over your people, I just ask that you would change our hearts change our minds and change our expectations. Father, that we wouldn't look the way that we, we think we should look. God, I want to look the way that you want to see me. And God, we just thank you for that. We thank you for your love that never fails us, that never stops. And we just ask that you would continue to be with us as we leave this place. God, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.